straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. It's a false start for the trial of Derek Chauvin, charged in the death of George Floyd. Why the trial judge is waiting for the Minnesota Court of Appeals to rule on how to proceed. Everything you need to know about jury selection and more in our Gavel to Gavel coverage. Attorneys for the so-called Doomsday Cult duo are due back in court. Our legal analysis on what to expect during the latest hearing for Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. The search is on for two missing boys, both presumed dead and thrown into the Ohio River. The sheriff who says he won't give up looking for the bodies of three-year-old Nilo Lattimore and six-year-old James Hutchinson. Maybe uh, we'll get lucky and find... Plus ...for us to cover the trial of Derek Chauvin charged with murdering George Floyd. Jury selection was set to begin Monday morning, but is now delayed until Tuesday. So let's break it all down. Derek Chauvin is facing two charges, second-degree unintentional murder and second-degree manslaughter. Prosecutors also charged Chauvin with third-degree murder. Judge Peter Cahill dismissed the charge for lack of probable cause. Now, the Minnesota Court of Appeals says Judge Cahill erred in not reinstating the charge following the appeals court's presidential ruling in the case of another former officer. But as jury selection was set to begin, Judge Cahill says he doesn't have jurisdiction. And prosecutors have a stay to proceedings as we wait the higher court's guidance. We have filed with the Court of Appeals a motion to stay the trial pending resolution of jurisdiction with the Court of Appeals and in the appeal. Uh, I believe it was just accepted moments ago. With that, I think we really do need to hear from the Court of Appeals and they have not gotten back to you yet. Correct. We have sent all the jurors home. I think what we were looking for first is, should we keep going while they consider the motion? I mean, give us a preliminary sign of should we put the brakes on completely now while you consider the merits of the request for a stay because that stay is probably for a much longer time. Uh, if it's not clear in our initial motion that we filed with them, if we do a reply, we will try to be very clear about sort of that two-step uh, you know, assistance we're looking for from our court. Chauvin's defense attorney says he's ready for trial and that the appeal shouldn't stop the start of jury selection. Because the only issue pending in the appeal is the reinstatement of the murder in the third degree charge, that means that everything else is, is within the court's jurisdiction. There are two additional charges, murder in the second degree as well as the manslaughter charge, jury selection, motions in limine, all of these things can be accomplished. I just wanted to, to inform the court that we're, we're prepared to try this case. It is, it is not our intent to cause delay by filing a PFR with the Minnesota Supreme Court. However, um, I feel I have an ethical obligation to my client and to other criminal defendants to do so because it was a published, published or excuse me, precedential opinion. That's what's going on in the courtroom. And Jeanette Levy is here to fill us in on what's going on outside the courthouse. Yeah, Brian, you know, the day started out with a protest by a bunch of rally goers, social justice groups. Seating is limited here at the Hennepin County courtroom because of the or the courthouse because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So people are really showing their support for George Floyd by gathering outside and holding rallies in the streets. They're keeping track of what's going on by watching live streams and keeping track of social media. Now, members of George Floyd's family have been given one seat in the courtroom. Floyd's sister Bridget Floyd occupied that seat on the first day. Now, while court is in session, protesters filled the area around the courthouse and the streets. Bridget Floyd said afterwards that it was hard to be in the courtroom with Derek Chauvin and that she and her family need and appreciate the community's support. Now, there hasn't been any show of support for Derek Chauvin outside of the courthouse. There are people supporting him online, though. Jury selection will resume on Tuesday morning. The judge said he will bring in 14 jurors on Tuesday. Seven of those will be in the morning and seven will be in the afternoon for questioning by attorneys from both sides. Brian. Thanks, Antoinette. Here to break down the first day of jury selection in the trial of the murder of George Floyd is law and crime host Jesse Weber and Terry Austin. Jesse, jury selection without knowing what the charges are, is that a problem or is that something that can, I don't know, be figured out as they go? Well, it becomes a question that was really interesting in today from what we heard from the judge because he said, how many times do you have a case where you're prosecuting somebody for murder and then you have the whole case go through. And at the end of the day, at the end of the trial, you say, how about we include the lesser includeds now? 
And does that really that different from what we have here? And I'd say it really is different. I don't think that you can start this trial without knowing the third degree murder charge. That is very different than second degree murder and very different than second degree manslaughter. So I was of the camp surprised to see the judge wanting to push forward with this without a definitive answer on that charge. Yeah, and we'll see how that plays out because the way they're planning it out, they still have three weeks to impanel this jury. Now, Terry, what did the judge mean about not having jurisdiction? How's that playing out? Well, you know, technically, Judge Cahill has jurisdiction over the trial, but he doesn't have jurisdiction over this specific issue of the appeal. And the issue currently appeal, uh, on appeal, rather, is this third-degree murder charge and whether or not that should be reinstated. And it doesn't really make sense to go forward on more substantive issues, like actually, in my opinion, jury selection. But I think certain motions, evidentiary motions, could go forward. But the judge is being careful. He wants to hear what the Court of Appeals says, and he wants to wait for them to say, yes, you can go forward on these various issues, like jury selection. Now, Angela, is it correct that not a single person was questioned today? Do you get a sense the case is moving along in any way, shape, or form? Not one single juror was brought into the courtroom to be questioned at all. Uh, both sides argued for that or against it. The prosecution did not want any of the jurors questioned until they could tell the jurors definitively what charges Derek Chauvin would be facing. So the judge said at the end of the day that he wants to move forward. It is his plan to start jury selection on Tuesday, but he is going to wait for the Court of Appeals before proceeding because no one wants to create an appellate issue if is a conviction in this case, and they can't retry it, obviously, if he, Derek Chauvin, were to be acquitted because of double jeopardy. Exactly. Well, hopefully the Court of Appeals is listening and we can keep up with this case as it goes on. Thank you, everyone. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, what's next for the Doomsday Cult duo, Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell? But first, back in the courtroom for the Derek Chauvin trial, attorneys reach pre-trial agreements while they wait for the Court of Appeals ruling. Our legal analysis after the break. Barricades, barbed wire, and fortified fencing, the sites surrounding the courthouse in Minneapolis where Derek Chauvin is scheduled to stand trial for the murder of George Floyd. The National Guard, along with the state and local law enforcement, have descended upon the city preparing for unrest. But, as Anjanette Levy tells us, not all are happy with the ramped up security. Yeah, that's right, Brian. You know, businesses here in downtown Minneapolis, some have actually closed. Others have boarded up windows preparing for any unrest that could happen during this trial. And as you can see behind me, there is a double ring of fencing around the Hennepin County Courthouse. Now, the National Guard is also here at the courthouse with armed members behind the fencing with armored trucks. There are concerns about violence after the unrest last year following the death of George Floyd, and some of the protesters say they feel like the fencing sends a message that Derek Chauvin will be acquitted before the trial even starts. I think that people are entitled to public trials, um, and I think that um, acting like somehow um, you know, we can't behave responsibly um, to observe these trials and so forth, and that we have to be, you know, not just kept out of the government center, but kept off the property around it, that this is our property. Um, with these, you know, multiple layers of chain link fences and razor wire, I think it really um, suggests to people that there might be, that there might not be justice in this case. A lot of people say to me, you know, they put these fences up because they're planning to let this guy off. And I think a lot of people believe that. And city and county officials here in Minneapolis have said that they're just trying to be prepared for anything. They've used what happened at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th as a prime example. They estimate here that the city and the county have spent about $1 million on security measures. Brian. Thanks, Anjanette. And in court, both sides agreed to a number of conditions, including not allowing witnesses to watch live streaming of the trial and preparing, or sorry, and referring to Floyd and Chauvin by their names, not victim and defendant. I think it is most appropriate, because I think it's most respectful, to refer to people by their names. So, for example, not victim or deceased, but as George Floyd, for example. 
Uh, I think it is much more respectful to call people that way. But however, I also don't want to micromanage the language used by counsel if there is a reasonable basis in the record to say so. So I actually do allow the state to say victim. I do allow the uh, defense to say something other than that to describe, for example, in this case, Mr. Floyd. I do allow the state to use the term defendant. And uh, Mr. Nelson, I'm sure, will use Mr. Chauvin. Back to talk Derek Chauvin and jury selection of law and crimes, Jesse Weber and co-host Terry Austin. Terry, what did you make of these motions in limine? Were there any conditions that stood out to you? I think all of the conditions made complete sense. I mean, if you think about it, one of the conditions was they did not want the witnesses to look at any live stream. And if you think about when you are in court, witnesses aren't allowed to see other witnesses. So I think that's very consistent with what would happen if everyone were in the courtroom. And so also, I think it does make sense to call the parties by their names. The judge said he wasn't going to demand it, but if they agree to call each other by their names other than victim or defendant, it is more respectful. And frankly, it can be a little derogatory when you say the victim and when you say the defendant. So, so far, from what we've seen, I think all of this makes complete sense. Jesse, let's kind of touch on that point. There was a lot of agreement between the sides in the motions eliminate. Like, let's talk exactly about that victim and defendant. You don't hear that type of agreement in rape cases or other murder cases. Should we be reading into both sides agreeing so much? No. Let me tell you something. If today was any inclination, I don't think this is going to be smooth sailing for the weeks and maybe months to come, because these are two sides that are basically at odds in what could be arguably be the most important and high profile trial we've seen in 20 years. I really think that this is a sign of nothing. I think both sides are going to be back. And by the way, both sides are excellent legal counsel, and I think that you are going to see fireworks as soon as this trial ultimately starts. I think you're going to see it with jury selection. I don't think whatever you saw today, whatever agreement, is a sign of things to come. Now, Anjanette, what should we be expecting for the second day of jury selection? Are we going to start seeing those fireworks, perhaps, as Jesse is suggesting? You know, I think we very well could if jury selection begins. Remember, we're still waiting to hear from the Court of Appeals. The judge said he wants to forward with the questioning, the voir dire process, with the potential jurors, but we have to wait and see what the Court of Appeals says. The judge wanted to go forward today and felt that he had the legal wherewithal, the right to do so, but the prosecution wanted to hold off on that. All right, Court of Appeals, the ball is in your court. We're all waiting and hoping to see what happens next. Thank you all. Be sure to tune in to the Law and Crime Network for gavel to gavel coverage of Derek Chauvin's trial. Still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, the search for two missing boys in Ohio continues. What's making the search difficult? Plus, the prosecution is making demands from the doomsday cult duo as the duo tries to move the trial. Welcome back. Attorneys for the so-called doomsday cult duo are due back in court, and this time it's the prosecutors who are making the demands. Taylor Austin breaks down what to expect at this latest court hearing for Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. Prosecutor Wood is asking the judge to order attorneys for the couple to hand over a survey they created, saying it should be entered into evidence. Lori Vallow and her husband Chad Daybell are charged with concealing and destroying evidence while Vallow's children were reported missing. Authorities discovered the bodies of J.J. and Tylee Ryan buried in shallow graves on Daybell's property. The defense wants to move their trial to another county, saying they won't be able to get an impartial jury in Fremont County. Chad Daybell's attorney conducted a poll as proof for why the defense says a change of venue is needed. Now, Wood wants to see the survey for himself, requesting that it be filed into the court record. Let's bring in Law and Crime's Jesse Weber and Terry Austin to discuss the latest in Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell's case. Terry, this seems like an easy request. The survey supports a change of venue. Give it to opposing counsel in the court. So, so what's the big deal? 
Exactly, Brian. You know, if the survey, in fact, supports a change of venue, why is the defense withholding the evidence? I think that perhaps the problem is in the questions, and maybe the defense doesn't want the judge to see those questions because the risk is that the court could review these questions in the survey and they could rule that they were biased or looking for certain answers and maybe the survey will be, you know, dismissed and maybe the fact that the venue will stay exactly what it is. It's odd, Brian. I don't know why they would object to this, particularly when they are the ones who took the survey. Yeah, Jesse, as a public defender, I kind of giggled when I first heard this. Imagine you don't have to share this information. You could just tell the other side, hey, I did this survey. We're supposed to change venues. I don't need to show you anything. That'd be a crazy, I would love it, but that'd be a crazy rule. Why are we lawyers then? Why are we lawyers? We have to prove everything. There should be no such thing as evidence. You can't just say, this is what I want. Trust me, it's a good decision. That's not the way the legal system works. And especially in this kind of case, which is incredibly high profile, and there is a lot riding on it. To make a serious decision like a change of venue, you better give some proof about why that's the case. Now, I can't say I'm that surprised because I've seen the defense and the prosecution throughout this case highly antagonistic. Remember, it was the defense who wanted to kick Rob Wood off this case. So I don't, I probably think this is a sign for more things to come as this trial go, uh, gets further and further towards that trial. Definitely getting heated asking for things, but hey, I can't show you my notes. We'll see how that plays out. Thank you both. When we come back, an update on the search for two missing boys in Ohio. The lengths one local sheriff and an entire community are taking to try to find their bodies. Next. We're back. An Ohio sheriff is speaking out after searches for two missing boys in two separate cases have yielded no results. Three-year-old Nilo Lattimore has been missing since December. His mother's boyfriend, Deshaun Brown, is charged with murdering her after police found her body in a bag along the Ohio River. Prosecutors say a nearby stroller belonged to Natisha and Nilo Lattimore and believe Brown also killed the little boy. Now, search crews are also looking for six-year-old James Hutchinson. His mother, Brittany Gosney, reported him missing in late February. Police say she later confessed to killing him and throwing his body in the Ohio River. Investigators believe she was pressured by her boyfriend, James Hamilton. Butler County Sheriff Richard Jones says high water levels have made the searches challenging. It's very difficult. Uh, uh, the way I understand it, the searchers aren't going to get in the water. It's too dangerous. It's still too high. Uh, but that's where we're using the aerial, the, the sheriff's helicopter, and they're uh, going over the river, up and down the banks. Uh, we have um, uh, our equipment there so they can have a command post. They, I don't believe they're going to be anybody in the water today but, uh, because it's, it's, it's so high yet. But they're going to look along the banks. They're going to look on top with the helicopter, maybe the drone use also. Uh, it's very difficult. but. Uh, when you have a, a, a six-year-old, the uh, body's been thrown in the water, it's so devastating, and people are so angry over this child being thrown in the river. We want to do all we can to help. Brittany Gosney has been indicted on charges of murder and kidnapping. Investigators are hoping her alleged confession will give vital clues to help find her son's body. Everybody's on high alert, uh, but uh, it depends on the temperatures of the water, what happens to the human body. Um, uh, and I don't want to be, get very graphic as we're talking, but the temperatures of the water, the temperature above the water, and how the body reacts. Uh, you, you fill up with air, you float. Uh, there's details that I cannot give uh, of what exactly took place. Uh, we're trying to find the body, but uh, it, you know where the body is located, if we're fortunate, uh, the body would be on the side of the bank uh, or up floating to where we can find the child. It's multiple jurisdictions uh, to where uh, the crimes took place. It, uh, apparently, it appears it started in Preble County, ended up in Butler County, and then ended up in uh, on the Ohio River. I believe it's uh, Lawrenceburg in Indiana. So there's lots of multiple jurisdictions, the way I understand it. The Butler County Prosecutor's Office 
is uh, uh, is in charge of the prosecution, and that's not unusual. It happens when there's multiple jurisdictions involved. Back one last time is Terry Austin for analysis. Terry, as you're hearing this sheriff describe the struggles of searching for these children, they're, they're searching 21 miles of the bank. No one's going in the water because the water levels are so high. Are, are you hopeful that we'll be able to find these two young boys, or are you, or are you kind of, I don't know, a little heartbroken that this might end up um, worse and not find them? It's difficult, Brian. This is the Ohio River. You're looking for two small bodies. One is three, one is six, and they're doing the best that they can. I think that, obviously, if we can find these bodies, it'll bring some closure to the families. But at this point, it's been days. I think it's going to be very difficult. Water runs fast, and you heard the sheriff there talking. It's, it's a very difficult search. Now, Terry, I, I like the fact that you brought up the word closure. I know you and I have had this conversation before because we watched so many of these trials where we've seen past cases where the defendant admits guilt and gives information to the officers to help them find the body for a lesser sentence. Do you think in, in either of these cases that should be something the prosecutor should be con considering? Absolutely not. Not for either one of these cases because they were so heinous and we're talking about young children. So I think they should get the maximum. Got you. Thank you, Terry. And thank you for joining us here on Long Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America. Thank you.